rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good evening. <clears throat> When we look at the Bible, we always find words of wisdom. And in Proverbs 6, there are wise words we really truly need to study and understand. In Proverbs 6, starting with verse 16, we are told, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that deceiveth wicked imaginations, feet be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discard among the brethren. My son, keep thy father's commandments, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them about thy neck. <clears throat> These six things that the Lord hate. Maybe we need to understand these six things the Lord does hate. The Lord our God, if there's something he hates, if there's things that are an abomination unto him, I mean, what we just read in Ezekiel ought to make you scared enough to be clear. When they say him, they're talking about God our Father in heaven. As we're studying the Bible, that is, the written word of God, we soon see that all the things that the Lord does hate all are to be found in a man called <coughs> Belidal, the son of the sons of Belidal and the daughters of Belial. The Bible shows to us that Belial is a wicked man, a worthless man in the eyes of God. A wicked man, a worthless man in the eyes of God. Whoa! Something we don't even want to be close to. We find in scriptures that Belial is used to humanize wickedness and worthlessness. In Deuteronomy, <clears throat> we first see this name used. Deuteronomy 13, 13 is written for us to understand and read. It says, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. This is totally against God's commandment, as we see in Deuteronomy 13, 4, as well as we find in other scripture. For in Deuteronomy 13, 4, it is written, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, and keep his commandment, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Folks, we still have commandments today. It is still written for us today. <clears throat> And 16 times we see the name of Belial is used in the Old Testament, and not one time was it used that one wants to, by one that wanted to please God the Father. And when we read this and we see this, we don't want to be anywhere near it because we do not want to be one that the Lord hates or is an abomination unto him. <clears throat> Belial is a descriptive people characterized by worthlessness and corruption, a person without a yoke, someone who is lawless and rebellious. When you read the Old Testament, one can clearly see they do not want to be called a person or a son or a daughter of Belial, for then God would be then consider you as a worthless and corrupt person. A person without a yoke, someone who is lawless or rebellious, and rebellious, and all these are a sin, and it would take away our place in heaven. Don't forget, in 1 Samuel 15, 23, we are reminded, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. King Saul lost his crown because of his rebellion against God the Father. <clears throat> what you say? That's the Old Testament. So many people say, that's the Old Testament. God's not like that in the New Testament. Hmm. Let's look in the New Testament. And let's see what is written for us today. 
We find in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 a warning from Jesus about being among the wicked men of this world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, we need to listen to the warning of our Savior Jesus, who tells to all who have ears, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Ye, for ye are the temple of the living God. And God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separated, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughter, saith the Lord Almighty. That is in 2 Corinthians, which is in the New Testament. The only time that this word is really used as identifying as a person or something of that nature is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where the name is applied to Satan. There is no indication from Scripture that Belial is the proper name of a specific demon, but it is used as one. In this chapter in verse 1, the Apostle Paul is telling all the Christians, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. <clears throat> Paul's warning us today. Today, just as he warned the, fellows, the followers of Christ back then about the encroachment of paganism against the holy faith. And it's still alive and well in today's world. When we are commanded not to be, we are commanded not to be unyoked. Let me back up. We are commanded not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This means that no Christian has any business making alliance of any kind with pagans. And yes, that includes marriage. Amen. Why should any Christian wife accept a pagan for a husband? Why should a husband? a Christian husband, except a pagan for a wife. Paul's not discussing this situation when one couple, when a pagan couple comes to the Lord and one comes and one does not. He's already dealt with that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul here is laying down a rule that forbids such alliance in the first place after one becomes in alignment with Christ. When one comes with alignment in Christ Jesus, they shouldn't be aligning themselves with non-believers of this world. For it will only bring heartache. And it may put one's soul in jeopardy. If one does align themselves with one who has not Jesus with them as a common relationship. This warning is not limited to the application of marriage only though. It's for any close alliance that you may have. Why would you want to be a business partner with someone who is not a Christian? Why would you want to have recreation and do things like that with people who are not Christians or have a union because it can be nothing but a disaster for a Christian. The inspired writer Paul lays it all out showing that Christians and paganism are adversaries as different as righteousness and wickedness or light and darkness. So ask yourself, what harmony hath Christ with Be <coughs> Belial? Or what portion hath a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has a temple of God with idols. We just saw that. Does not have one, does it? Paul here used Bilal as an alternative word for Satan. So we need to be sure that we understand what the Lord our God hates. So we are not to be likened unto Bilal, for we are a temple. We are a temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God and they shall be my people. For one to be a holy temple of God demands that no compromise whatsoever be made with paganism. So we need to understand what it is God hates 
so that it remain a temple of God. So let us examine these things so we don't get caught up in them. First thing he talks about is a proud look. A Christian cannot have eyes that are delighted in scorning or belittling by looking down upon others or looking up them with disdain and contempt or reckoning them as unworthy to be looked upon at all because they have such a high opinion of their own worth. So many have a high opinion of their own worth and their own merit, and they think they're so much greater than others. Pride is the first of the hateful things mentioned. It is being the first sin committed. We're sure from what we read that is the sin of the fallen angel. And it's a sin of Adam. Adam must have had such a high opinion of himself, he disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. What else could you think of it being? Pride is a major evil in human nature. And it's directly opposite to God, and it's opposed to God and to his nature, and against which he sets himself. For God resisteth the proud. <clears throat> In James chapter 4, gives us a better understanding of what pride is about. We find in James chapter 4, verse 5, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwell in us lusts to envy, but he giveth more grace? Wherefore he say, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. The pride of the heart shows itself in the eyes or by the look of a man. As we see through the scripture, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And by my resistance to being a proud mind, I am drawing nigh to God. And he is drawing nigh to me. And by doing this, I am resisting the evil one. I'm resisting the devil. I'm resisting Satan. Remember that pride is of the devil, not of God. The second hateful thing we see that God hates is a lying tongue. A Christian cannot have a tongue that speaketh falsehood, knowingly and willingly with an intent to deceive others, to hurt the characters of a neighbor or to flatter a friend is a most deceitful evil there is. This ought to be repugnant to men, for we know it is to God for our Father God in heaven is a God of truth. And we see in Psalms 33, verse 4, it tells us, The word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. Everything the Lord does is in truth. Amen? Amen. When a man or a woman has a lying tongue, is there anything more in them that resembles the devil? who is the father of all lies. And Jesus gives us fair warning about lying and being of the evil one. If we look in the gospel account told to us by St. John, chapter 8, Jesus warns us in chapter 8, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your fathers ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and of those not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now people say, oh, that's to the Sadducees and to the Pharisees. No, 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 no. That's to anyone who's a liar. He was just pointing it to them at that moment. Another thing that the Lord hateth, and a Christian cannot have, a Christian cannot have hands that shed innocent blood. Human blood. And that of persons who have been 
who have not been guilty of any capital sin for which they ought to die by the laws of God or of men is not what God is speaking of. As he demands this to be done, when you break the laws, or certain laws, he does demand the blood of men. But that's not innocent blood. God speaks of innocent blood. A Christian cannot have hands that shed innocent blood. These three sins are plainly to be seen as the son of Bilal, the Antichrist, who exerts himself above all that is called God, the king and prince of the earth. <clears throat> Satan and his followers speak lies and hypocrisy and is the whore that is drunk with the blood of the saints. We see in the writings of 2 Tim, uh, I'm sorry, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, we are told, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so <clears throat> soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so, that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Things to think about, what he's saying. We also find this in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 4. Again, this is all in the New Testament. These are words that we have as a Christian to understand. And we are told in 1 Timothy, chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. We find this also in the gospel account of Matthew in chapter 7, verse 15. Jesus warning to all who will hear, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Christ foretold that the wolves in sheep clothing would ravage the flock of God, indicating that the church itself would be the theater of the apocalypse, which the rejection of Christianity by someone who formerly was a Christian. They branded <clears throat> their conscience with a hot iron. This is the description of the hardened, blinded, this dreaded soul in whom the truth principle has utterly perished. This begins by rejecting what is known to be true. But in the progression, it leaves the deceiver totally without moral or spiritual guidance. Forbidding priests, forbidding monks to marry, forbidding nuns to marry, commanding all men to abstain from such foods as meat on such, such and such days, are exactly what Jesus, through Paul, is warning all who have ears about. It is so sad, it is so sad that so many will not take the time to study the Word of God and get an understanding what it is God wants from us. Everyone on earth needs to understand what the will of God is, and we need to learn to do it. Jesus paid a high price. He paid a high price so that I could have this written Word of God. What excuse do I have not to use it? Jesus promises us in Matthew 7, <clears throat> verse 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. 
Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. See, that's always the question. Are you seeking the word of the Lord? Are you knocking on the door of the Lord? Are you asking Jesus for help? That's so key. Today in America, we have innocent blood being shed and poured out like water. We have somewhere between 75 and 80 million innocent children murdered in our country, and they don't want to keep track anymore because the numbers are getting too high. They're being murdered for profit. The Democratic Party makes a fortune off of selling dead baby body parts. And how many in the Lord's church today support this? Such hands are defiled, and such men must be haters of God, for they are destroying his image. They're being like Satan. They're being like Bilal. Yes, they are the murdering of the children. One time they said, oh, it was to save the woman's life. When the baby is born and laying on the table and you're deciding whether to kill it, how is that saving the woman's life? It's about profit. These people, these people, those who support this in any way, shape, or form, you have chosen to be the sons and the daughters of the devil. For as we know in the scripture, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. <clears throat> what does a Christian have in common? What does any Christian have in common with someone who murders children for money? Oh, I know. People don't want to hear this. But it's the truth. They make money selling dead baby body parts. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How can one look at a brand new born child, the most innocent thing there is on earth? It's born laying there on the table and decide whether we're going to put it to sleep or not. They call putting it to sleep. It's murder, folks. It's murder because they want to sell the body parts. Now understand, a Christian cannot have a heart that dece de deceiveth wicked imaginations. A Christian cannot have thoughts of wickedness which are framed and formed in the heart. For this is a source and a fountain of all wickedness. The heart of a man is a place in which all these hateful and abominational things come from. And all these evil thoughts and designs both against God and men are planned. All these hateful and abominational things unto God our Father in heaven are forged and fabricated in the wicked heart of men who are the sons of Bilal. Jesus tells us, as we find in the gospel account, as told to us by St. Mark in chapter 7, verse 21, he says, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulterers, fornication, murderers, theft, covenant breakers, wickedness, deceit, lust, lovelessness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the men, man. <clears throat> and we know that these who have an heart that deceives wicked imaginations also have feet that be swift in running to mischief. We see today those who are in favor of shedding innocent blood are the same who are always coming up with wickedness and wicked ideals that go completely against God and Jesus. They go completely against Jesus. And many are quick to turn so many things around and say, well, they are the holy ones. They're doing this for God. They are constantly running here and there, spreading their programs 
and their lies, their deceit. They have infected our children. The children of the United States of America are infected with this horrible, poisonous, infectious disease. They convince these children that it's okay for a man to lay with a man and a woman to lay with a woman. It's okay to take what they call a mistake and just eliminate it. It's murder. They do not even tell the children about hell's fire. They are sick, sick people that do this. And they need a cure. Democrats today run to commit all manners of sin with greediness, especially murder. Democrats, at their murder child, will sell the dead baby body parts for money, for profit. They're sick people, and they need a cure. And the only cure they're going to get is Jesus Christ. They need to come to Jesus. Jesus will be their cure, and Jesus will forgive them for all their sins. But they have to come to Jesus. Tell me, what does a Christian have in common with those who murder children so they can sell the dead baby body parts? A Christian cannot support a false witness that speaketh lies. What does a Christian have in common with those that speaketh lies and as a false witness? Think about this. This is not the same as one that has a lying tongue because this one here is a false witness. They bear false witness against their neighbor, against a friend, against someone. Some people call it, he bloweth lies that raises and spreads them abroad and swears to them to the damage of others. How can a Christian support this? How can a Christian support him that soweth discord among brethren? You do not do this in a family or in a civil society, and you don't do this in a religious community. You do not want to soweth discord among brethren, and you cannot be a false witness. We find this in Romans chapter 16. And again, the Lord's church is set up to protect the people in the church from these false teachers, false preachers, from those who fall away. We are told in Romans 16, starting with verse 17, Now I beseech you, brother, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall be and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Jesus through Brother Paul tells us to mark them. It means identify them. Watch out for them. Be on guard against them. Do not shut your eyes to what they're doing nor make excuses for them, as so many do. You do not want anything that's going to cause division in the body. We need to make sure that we turn them away. This means that the brothers should have no fellowship with them. We have so many in the Lord's church today who support those who murder children and sell their body parts for a profit. They vote for them. They put signs in their, uh, in their lawns. They help put them in office. They send them money. They won't speak about the outrageousness of this atrocity, this abomination. We need to mark them. We need to study with them. We need to show them their ways. And if they don't change, they need to be gone. It really disturbs me 
that I hear about elders in the Lord's church who supported Hillary Clinton. Oh. When I see people who are pro-death, yes, it's called pro-death, not pro-choice, it's pro-death. You ever notice? We're called pro-life. They're called pro-choice. Well, if the choice is life or death, they must be of the pro-death party. Pro-death. They use their deceitfulness and wickedness. And they're masked and they're guarded. And they're camouflaged. And the press is so willing to cover it all up. And people who proclaim, who profess to love Jesus, supports them. How can you do this? They're causing a division. These people are causing a division between Jesus and the people because they draw them away. They draw them away as disciples after themselves. And mark my words, it is Satan. It is Satan's forces that are attacking and pulling them away and putting them in his army. Paul warns us that fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul's reference to the naive, unsophisticated Christian who is inclined to receive any good speech as a gospel truth, no matter what sacred truth may be denied in it, and never pauses to question anything, especially if the speech is a good one, and who thus unconsciously falls into the net of the false teacher and the deceiver. We've seen this throughout history. How do you think Hitler took over Germany? How do you think Obama became president? Satan knows his time is short and is doing all he can to round up all the souls he can. We need to take a stand against the devil. We need to take a strong stand against this deceiver. <clears throat> Pre pretending to serve Christ, many serve themselves alone. They will speak with a flow of elegant words. They have all this impressive rhetoric. People talk about them all the time, of how great of a speaker they are. They're always acting like they're doing it for the women. They're doing it for humanity. But those who are falling into this trap, those who fall into this trap, they do not study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus tells us, My son, keep thy father's commandments, and forsake not the law of thy mother. These are the words of God, the Father. God our Father in heaven. They are a commandment of God himself. They're given to us by Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. And we need to follow them so we can remain sons and daughters of God. A Christian needs to bind the words of God continually upon their heart. If you would, go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Again, heaven or hell is really where it comes down to. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 16. We are told, this is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds, and I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he hath concentrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to promise. And let us consider one another <clears throat> to provoke unto love and to good works. All of these, forgiveness, redemption, 
reconciled or found in Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. The most precious words in all the Bible, perhaps, were for reference to the hope of eternal life and in the view and the numbers and the weight of the sins that we have are these. Think of these words that the Lord says. And their iniquities will I remember no more. Wow. How sacred is this promise. Sin, which most people themselves cannot forget. We can't forget our sins. The devil uses them against us. But God won't forget them. They're gone. They're wiped away. Remember no more. It's a whole big contrast to the Jews who remembered theirs year by year by year. He remembered them every year and they had to re-sacrifice. Man remembers. God the Father forgets them. When one becomes a new creature in Christ, when one goes under that water and comes up a new creature in Christ, God the Father in heaven remembers them no more. As a Christian, we should desire to draw near to God with a true heart and fullness of faith, which simply means for one to have a true and wholehearted faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a son of the one and only true living God, have a full confidence in his power and in the Godhead because of the Holy Ghost. We covered seven things God hates. But really, in fact, they are also an abomination unto him. But we also know there are many other things in the Bible that we need to understand and make sure that we do not do these things that the Lord our God hates. Because when we do an abomination unto God, it is an abomination unto his soul. The things the Lord doth hate are all found in the man of Bilal, the son of Bilal and the daughters of Bilal. We do not want to be the sons and daughters of Bilal. And we need to make sure to make sure that we're not going down the wrong road. Because Jesus said what? There's a pathway to heaven and a broad highway to hell. In order to stay on that pathway to heaven, one must study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun for vain and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Amen. Let us work on staying away from these things that the Lord our God, our Father in heaven, and Jesus and the Holy Ghost as well, hate. This week, let's all study to show ourselves approved unto God. Let's all be a workman that needeth not be ashamed. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. Don't back down when people are saying something that you know is not right. Use the Bible. If they want to walk away, walk away. But don't agree. Don't say, we'll just have to agree to disagree. No. This is what the Lord says. Show me something different. We want to be called the sons and daughters of God. Not the sons and daughters of the devil. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ for any reason, why would we be? Jesus has his blood, a continuous cleanse us. All we have to do is repent for our sins. All we have to do is repent and go to Christ and beg for forgiveness and tell him that help us stay away from these sins. And if you don't have the blood of Christ, what is keeping you away what is separating you from being part of the kingdom? Why not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Why not accept him as your Lord and Savior? Who are you going to accept? Jesus or the devil? That's your only two choices. Become part of Jesus' fold. Go under the water. Come up a new creature in Christ. And then you receive the gift of the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, who will be with you while you're here on this earth.
praise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior.